So this week is the celebration of the pagan festival of Easter, a time where half the people celebrating believe they are worshiping the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. And the other half don't care about that, but love the Easter dinners, the Easter bunny, and all that other stuff that goes along with it. But besides the known pagan worshipers who know exactly what they are celebrating, the majority of those who celebrate are really in the dark about this pagan celebration. Partaking in customs they should not be partaking in based on what they say they believe in. It is during these times, very much like the times of Christmas, where you can really understand how fallen this world has become and how far the world has moved away from the Most High. People feel that they are worshiping him, but are actually doing the complete opposite. And the worst part is they are contributing to spiritually dark energy that is taking hold of this entire world. Now, the simple thing that people like to do when they speak against holidays like Christmas and Easter is explain that they are pagan, saying things like, I don't celebrate Easter because it's a pagan holiday. And that's valid. And we feel that this explanation should bring clarity around the subject. And the truth is, in a better world, that should be all that we need to say to other believers. But because of how fallen this world is, and how intellectually ignorant the masses are today, simply saying pagan doesn't say enough. Most people don't understand what pagan actually is. Then there are others that are just caught up in their traditions and aren't interested in making changes. And the rest really just don't care. And so we keep going over the same things for years and years with our family and friends speaking on the same things. But in these last days, we need to be a little more bolder and clearer in our message to others and really dig into what this whole pagan thing is about. This celebration is deeper than just the holiday of Easter, but more about the satanic goddess that is being praised that leads back to Lucifer. You see, that's a deep statement that really needs to be understood because this holiday is about worshiping the moon. It's about worshiping fertility. It's about worshiping a goddess, which in the end leads back to the worship of Lucifer. Make no mistake and make sure this is abundantly clear to all, regardless if you celebrate this festival or not. This celebration of Easter is about the mother goddess, the whore of Babylon, the sacred feminine, Madonna, the queen of heaven, whom people refer to by different names, one being Ishtar, or what we call Easter. This is a time of spiritual wickedness, and it translates to much more than many actually know. We need to talk about it and call it out. We need to discuss the worship, the belief, the celebration, the acceptance of the mother goddess, and then where it all leads. Let's begin. Okay, so let's cover first what paganism is, because it is important to understand this. Now, I have spoken about this in greater detail in the first video of the History of Religion series. From this video, you will know that all roads to paganism goes back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. If you have not watched this video, please make sure that you do because it will provide a good foundation for your understanding. This right here will just be an overview. Okay, so Nimrod is the father of paganism. You read about him briefly in Genesis chapter 10 and more in depth in the book of Jasher. He was worshiped as the sun god and known by many names. The Hebrews refer to him as Baal, as well as Moloch. His followers were Baal worshipers. And because of their worship of him, they were associated with actions of idolatry, demon worship, human sacrifice, and many other occult practices. There was an absolute and very clear separation between Israel and the followers of Moloch. In the scriptures, you will see Yahuwah expressly speak to Israel against following those who worship Moloch. Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. That's Leviticus chapter 20, verse two. There are many different references to Moloch, who again goes back to Nimrod. In paganism, he is the sun god, also known as father god. Now Nimrod's mother slash wife was Semiramis. When Nimrod died, she became pregnant and found another way to stay in power. She told the people that it was the spirit of Nimrod that impregnated her. She claimed she was having a virgin birth 
from the spirit of Nimrod. She claimed to have slept with no man and was impregnated by Nimrod's spirit. Nimrod was now a father and Semiramis was the mother. She made herself a goddess, claiming that she was divinely created. She had them believe she came down to the earth from the moon in a giant moon egg that fell into the Euphrates River. The Queen of Babylon, aka Madonna, aka Ishtar, aka Semiramis, is the mother goddess in paganism. She is known as the moon goddess. When the baby was born, he would then be celebrated as a god, as Nimrod, back from the underworld. She claimed that her baby was reborn, renewed, or otherwise reincarnated Nimrod. The child's name was Tammuz. Now, there are many parts to this story of paganism that brings more clarity on many different traditions that we hold on with Easter. Like, why is there always a ham served on Easter? When Yah told Israel that swine was unclean. When understanding the pagan beliefs, you understand why there are Easter eggs and hot cross buns. None of those traditions are scriptural, and they don't have anything to do with the word of Yah. But believers around the world partake in them, because it is just tradition being passed down. But this video isn't specifically about Easter. I made a video about Easter, so if you would like to know more about this holiday, specifically, watch that video. The point that I am making is that much of these holidays and traditions that many take part in today all stem from paganism. Paganism is the worship of the three God structure, Father God, Mother God, and Son of God, along with many other smaller gods. It is a polytheistic belief in many gods. It is an unholy trinity and it has been the basis of religion all over the world for millennia. What we must discuss is a major part of this unholy trinity, and that is the mother goddess, the moon goddess. She is a spiritual figure that has been worshipped for millennia, but somehow it is not something that is picked up on by most people, especially by the self-proclaimed Christian community who are actually supposed to be expressly against her. We see her everywhere. We see the worship of her everywhere. We see churches in her name, but most people still are not making the full connection. Like when I say this to Catholics, they are quick to shout that we don't worship Mary. But then you see one of their churches called Mary, queen of the universe. I mean, look at it. People aren't making the connection. And even those that go to these churches, many of them don't understand what they are doing. So before we talk about today, Let's keep going back in the past so that we understand this mother goddess figure. Like I said, she starts in the first Babylon, Samaria with Semiramis. After Nimrod's death and the birth of Tammuz, Semiramis, now widow of Nimrod, mother of Tammuz, came to be represented as the pagan fertility goddess. It's important that you remember that because this is used consistently and most people don't recognize what it is. So with that in mind, it's important to understand that the original pagan festival of Easter was actually a sex orgy that celebrated the return of life via the fertility of Semiramis, aka Ishtar's conception of Tammuz. Worshippers of the ancient Babylonian religion celebrated the conception, not the birth, but the conception of Tammuz on the first Sunday after the full moon that followed the spring equinox. They celebrated it by baking cakes to Ishtar, getting drunk, engaging in sex orgies and prostitution in the temple of Ishtar. Women were required to celebrate the conception of Tammuz by lying down in the temple and having sex with whoever entered. Babies were sacrificed in the honor of these pagan gods, and their blood was then consumed by the worshipers. The priest of Easter would sacrifice infants, human babies, and then take the eggs of Easter as symbols of fertility and then they dye them in the blood of the sacrificed infants, human babies. The Easter eggs would hatch on December 25th, nine months later. The same day her son Tammuz, the reincarnate sun god, would be born. What they were doing was known as a sacrifice to Moloch. That's what these pagan worshippers did. Again, that's why we see Yah expressly speak to Israel against it in his law. I will set my face against the man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Moloch to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man 
when he gives some of his descendants to Moloch and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Moloch. That's Leviticus chapter 20 verses 3 through 5. You see, in the ancient world, there were pagans and there was Israel. This was the separation. The rest of the world were polytheistic. They worshiped many gods. Yahuwah warned Israel of taking part in any of the abominations that the pagan nations participated in. So now, if you just fast forward to today, because religion is so confusing and there are so many of them, people aren't really able to put two and two together about what is really going on and who is actually being worshipped within these pagan holidays. But I'm not trying to get ahead of myself. Let me go back. What needs to be made clear is that the ancient world worshipped this mother goddess. Israel was the only nation commanded against it. Depending on the different nation, the different tribe, tongue, or time period, she went by different names. Like in Samaria, she was Semiramis. But in the next major empire, after which was Egypt, she was known as Isis. Now, as the Israelites were moving towards their promised land, which was inhabited by the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, those tribes also worshipped the mother goddess. Again, they were all pagans, polytheistic. For instance, the Canaanites worshipped the mother goddess under the name of Astarte or Ashtaroth. To the Canaanites, she is the queen of heaven. Israel was told many times not to follow after how these nations worship their gods. When Yahuwah, your Elohim, cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship Yahuwah your Elohim in that way. For every abomination to Yahuwah which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 29 through 32. I mean, it's very clear. It's important to understand the contempt Yah had for her and how much he was expressly against anything dealing with her. When you read your Bible, you will see many mentions to this mother goddess, like in Judges chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of Yahuwah and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook Yahuwah and did not serve him. So the anger of Yahuwah was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. Now, do you see why Yah was hot against these people? They were serving the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Understand that is plural because it was these pagan gods from these other tribes. The Baals and the Ashtoreths are saying the father god and the mother god of these tribes. That's paganism. But that's not all we see in the scriptures. There's many references to the mother goddess and Ashtoreth. I'll show you a few more. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger? Says Yahuwah. Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? That's Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 17 through 19. You see it? They were making cakes for the queen of heaven. That's her again. And Yah is not having it. Listen to the judgment Judah received for fornicating with this queen of heaven. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, with all the women who stood by, a great multitude, and all the people who dwelt in the land of Egypt, and Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of Yahuwah, we will not listen to you, but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth, to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done, 
we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food, were well off, and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. The woman also said, And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cakes for her to worship her and pour out drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? Then Jeremiah spoke to all the people, the men, the women, and all the people who had given them that answer, saying, The incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and your princes, and the people of the land, did not Yahuwah remember them and did it not come into his mind? So Yahuwah could no longer bear it because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you committed. Therefore, your land is a desolation, an astonishment, a curse, and without an inhabitant, as it is this day, because you have burned incense and because you have sinned against Yahuwah and have not obeyed the voice of Yahuwah or walked in his law, his statutes, or in his testimonies. Therefore, this calamity has happened to you as at this day. Moreover, Jeremiah said to all the people and to all the women, Hear the words of Yahuwah, all Judah who are in the land of Egypt. Thus says Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, saying, You and your wives have spoken with your mouths and fulfilled your hands, saying, We will surely keep our vows that we made to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and pour our drink offerings to her. You will surely keep your vows and perform your vows? Therefore, hear the word of Yahuwah, all Judah who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says Yahuwah, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, Adonai, Yahuwah lives. Behold, I will watch over them for adversity and not for good. And all the men of Judah who are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until there is an end to them. Yet a small number who escape the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah. And all the remnant of Judah who have gone to the land of Egypt to dwell there shall know whose words will stand, mine or theirs. Wow. That's Jeremiah chapter 44 verses 15 through 28. I mean, you feel his power. You feel his anger. I'm really trying to drive this point home because I don't really think that the majority really gets it. And the thing is that those same practices that angered Yah before and caused Israel to receive that harsh judgment are the same practices people are doing today. But the worst part is they actually feel that they are serving Yah, which says even more about how wicked these days really are. I mean, look at what caused Solomon to receive such harsh judgment from Yah. For it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to Yahuwah, his Elohim, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of Yahuwah, and did not fully follow Yahuwah, as did his father David. That's 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. You see, this is really important to understand. Yah is absolutely against the mother goddess and any form of worship towards her. He condemned Israel and judged them harshly for fornicating with her. The first commandment is that we shall not have any gods before him. But this mother goddess, the queen of heaven, this Madonna, this whore of Babylon has been in our faces and many of us have fornicated with her and it must be stopped. Down the lines of history, her names have changed. Like I said earlier, in Egypt, the moon goddess was Isis. In Greece, she was Artemis. In Rome, she was known as Diana. In Nordic culture, the Vikings, the moon goddess was Joro. And in Roman Catholicism, where actually most of this modern day trouble and deception comes from, the moon goddess is the Virgin Mary. But to understand it more, let's look at it in more detail. Because as you continue to dig further, we can see where so much of this confusion comes from. In the catechisms of the Catholic Church, there are many different writings about Mary, but it is important to understand where they place her in the priority and importance. We can go to Catechism 966, which says, Finally, the Immaculate Virgin, preserved free from all stain of original sin, when the course of her earthly life was finished, was taken up 
body and soul into heavenly glory and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things so that she might be more fully conformed to her son, the Lord of Lords and conqueror of sin and death. The assumption of the blessed virgin is a singular participation in her son's resurrection and an anticipation of the resurrection of other Christians. In giving birth, you kept your virginity. In your dormition, you did not leave the world. O mother of God, but was joined to the source of life. You conceived the living God and by your prayers will deliver our souls from death. I rebuke that in the name of Yahusha. In reading that, do you notice how they casually call her the queen of heaven? It said, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things. Queen of heaven is actually an epithet or by name of Mary. I mean, you have to really see how cunning the devil is. He introduced the same pagan religions that was from the ancient worlds, these mystery religions, but he tied Jesus into it. So because people hear Jesus, they don't really question what they're doing. This is just another reason why I strongly believe in using his Hebrew name, Yahusha, so that I am clear in my distinction from their pagan blasphemous Messiah, because the Jesus that they worship is not the same Jesus that you read of in the King James Bible. You must understand that it's all goddess worship, and it has been spread throughout time. There are too many instances to even go over them all. I mean, look here in the United States. I mean, the capital of the United States is named after her. She is the main symbol of America. Let me show you. Washington, District of Columbia, is named after the goddess Columbia. This is a goddess they created to represent liberty. She is known in different ways, Lady Freedom and Lady Liberty. But she is a goddess, the goddess Libertas as well. The capital of the United States is her district. The New World Virgin Goddess Columbia was just a new manifestation of the ancient mother goddesses and virgin mother of God. Her location is not a coincidence either, being that DC is placed right between Virginia and Maryland. Just look at the names Virginia and Maryland and where her district is. Maybe you wanna say coincidence, but I think not. Now, just look at all the idols of the mother goddess that is throughout this land in America. At the top of the US Capitol building, we have the Statue of Freedom, a depiction of the goddess. It's pagan worship hidden in plain sight. Now, may I remind you that this nation claims to be a Christian nation, but yet they have pagan symbols everywhere, and they have spread this goddess of liberty. I mean, this goddess of liberty has spread throughout the world. The Masons of France sent America this gift of Lady Liberty, which is the main symbol of the United States. This is a pagan Roman goddess that all deals in the root of spiritual wickedness. When you look at the Statue of Liberty, notice that she is holding that torch, which is bearing the light. And that is what she is symbolized to do. Like it says on the statue's website, the Statue of Liberty enlightening the world. That is Masonic. And it refers to spreading light, bearing the torch. So if you don't really understand Freemasonry, you need to ask whose light is it that they're bearing? And just remember that Lucifer is the light bearer. We see this goddess symbol often with like Columbia Pictures or Liberty Mutual. I mean, look at this. Everyone has seen this with all the movies they present and a majority have no clue what this represents. When your eyes are open, you will see that it's everywhere. I mean, look at Beyonce's performance at the Grammys in 2017, depicting herself as the mother goddess, a fertility goddess. She looks very much like the Statue of Liberty. This is not by accident. Or when she's saying Ave Maria, literally meaning Hail Mary. Again, this is not by accident. All these examples and many more are done on purpose. This is pagan mother God worship. And what many people will be doing this weekend, whether they know it or not, is they will be contributing to the energy of pagan mother goddess worship that is disguised by religious tradition and mainstream Christianity. It doesn't really matter if people say, well, that's not me. That's not what I'm doing. I know I'm worshiping Jesus. I'm not worshiping any pagan goddess. This celebration of Easter was started in the occult. It started with paganism. You cannot change these customs. You cannot make your own rules to worship Yah. If you remember, I went through many scriptures that showed just how offensive it is to Yah. 
So please just don't say that you know that you're not doing this, so it doesn't really matter. It's not the case. But again, let me not get off track because this is not about Easter. This is about the mother goddess. We are in the midst of goddess worship, and it is important that you identify it and make sure that you are not partaking in the fornication. I mean, it's subtly pushed on us in unsuspecting ways. But we are being influenced by the whore of Babylon. We learn about her in Revelation chapter 17 and what becomes of her. It is important to understand that there is a difference between the whore of Babylon and mystery Babylon. But people often like to link them together. So let's read it. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations, and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yahusha. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For Elohim has put it in their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast, until the words of Elohim are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. That's Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 18. This is an important chapter. There's a lot going on in here. This chapter is talking of the whore of Babylon, and this is dealing with a religious entity. Now, what everyone wants to do is easily sum it up to be the Roman Catholic Church and declare it to be case closed. But it's much deeper than that. Allow me to explain. Now, in part seven of my Revelation series videos, I do go in much greater detail on the whore of Babylon, but I want to cover what's most important. You see, she came in riding on the beast and used the authority of the beast until her time was over. The whore of Babylon is not the Antichrist. She is the one system before the kingdom of the Antichrist, which all the kings, dictators, world leaders, and nations have been forced to bow down to throughout history. We're talking about the Babylonian mystery religions. No system in this world's history has spiritually enslaved more people. Mostly every false religion in this world can be traced back to Babylon. Even before citizens tried to build the Tower of Babel, Satan has made that city his headquarters and introduced idolatry, the first secret societies, and many of the religious practices that continue to be present to this day. These eventually appeared as the foundational teachings for Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Gaia worship, and many other cultic systems. 
summed up in the Bible as fornicating with the gods of the other nations. This should be recognized as I showed in the beginning of the video when Yah spoke expressly to Israel against serving the asterisks. Through the whore of Babylon, the world who was under her influence committed adultery with her and were led away from the Most High. She will be used to bring about the one world religion where everyone believes that they are worshiping the same God, just by different names. This is a major piece of prophetic history that you can see forming right now in front of our eyes. I've also made many videos about this. She spreads fornication to the world and promotes a harlotry away from the Most High. Think about ancient Israel and how they were led astray by her. They were judged harshly for it. And then if you just look back at history, you will see her spiritually whoring herself to be worshipped. She is spreading false light and she has been used in many ways to bring in her spiritual wickedness. And this is just a great reason why the Roman Catholic Church is always viewed as the whore of Babylon. But that is just because they use her so blatantly and out in the open. They absolutely should be linked to her. There's no question about it. But it's not just the influence of the Catholic Church that the whore consists of. She is the apostate religion who is filled with adultery and idolatry. There are many other apostate religions that come out of Babylon. Like I said, Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, etc. Those beliefs are not centered around the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has a tremendous amount of power and it is an extremely powerful tool used during these end times. But sometimes we give it more power than we should. The whore of Babylon brings an apostate idolatrous religion that takes us out of the will of the Most High. This is a universal apostasy. All that are influenced by the whore of Babylon are drunk off of her intoxication. The same way a drunken person naturally has no earthly idea what he is doing when they are drunk, the apostate group influenced by this harlot is so carried away with this false spiritual light that they too do not realize the terribleness of what they are doing. And it is important that at these times that we are in, that we are making sure that we are not a part of it. This is why we are called to be set apart. So listen, all of this is important because this weekend, this is exactly what the people who are celebrating Easter are contributing this spiritual energy to. They are strengthening the spiritual influence of the whore of Babylon. As you look at history and just how much of these pagan festivals have grown in acceptance, you can directly see a correlation with how wicked the world has become and how much blaspheme is accepted. For believers and followers of Yah, we should have nothing to do with her or her ways. We must be set apart and forsake anything that has to do with this mother goddess. Worship of the mother goddess is a huge part of the spiritual rebellion in this world and her influence is growing. And the sad part is that it's because of the many lukewarm conforming Christians that this one world religion is even able to gain as much ground as it has. As you conduct yourselves in this world, don't ignore the mother goddess, the moon goddess, the Madonna, the whore of Babylon. This is a representation of pure rebellion against Yah, and it is something that we must stand against. The leaders of the world are all about spreading this false light, and they desire to make it sound righteous or something that is pure. But in reality, it is quite dark. When we go around and look at the spring colors and Easter dresses, families getting together, and all else that comes along with it, just understand that in the spiritual realm, it is pure darkness being spread. This is the time where everyone gets up and goes to church, even those that don't ever think about it any other time of the year. This is when churches put up billboards to promote the churches to get more people to come. It is the biggest time of year for the churches. People will put on their IG post, he is risen, all this stuff. While at the same time, they promote a complete alignment to spiritual rebellion. We must make sure that we are aligning with the fullness of the scriptures. We must get away from churchianity. Churchianity, this spiritually dead religion that has put church tradition passed down in the priority of the scriptures. We must set ourselves apart from it. Yahushua the Messiah has risen, yes. He is the propitiation for our sins, yes. We must follow him and come to Father through him, yes. He paid the price for us and he is the foundation of our wonderful gift of grace, yes. This is absolutely true and it always should be spread. But if you believe this, then this means you must also live through this. 
You can't say you believe in this and then live your life in complete contradiction to his word. This whole video has been full of warnings and commands Yah has for his people to not follow after the other nation's gods. Do you honestly believe that those commands are no longer valid? That he now accepts it and doesn't mind it? You better go back and reevaluate that thought if you think that's what it is. We are called to be holy, be set apart. As the Apostle Peter wrote, please make sure you apply. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Yahusha the Messiah. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And that's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13-16. through 16. You see, make sure you are set apart. Don't play church. Be the church. Be of his assembly and proclaim the way. We do not partake in the spiritual wickedness spread through this mother goddess. We don't worship or celebrate the moon or fertility. There's a reason we are called to be set apart. And you will see that as you reject this blaspheme, living set apart becomes so much more clearer. It was important that this topic was covered because it goes into many other topics and doctrines. I've heard that there are some other mother god worshiping cults popping up that is confusing the masses. You now have at least a foundation in the truth that should allow you to denounce the wickedness and share more testimony of the truth to those who need it. As the days get spiritually darker, remember your purpose as a believer is to be a lampstand. You are the light of the world and it is your job to spread it. Cast down the lies and the blaspheme. Rebuke the spiritual wickedness in the name of Yahusha. You are a believer. Make sure in these last days, you live your life in his truth and through his power and in his love. He loves us so much. So in return, please make sure you live your life as a display of your love towards him and put no one above him. Remember, he is the most high and he is worthy of all of our praise. So let's praise him. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please don't forget to like and share this video with others. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. Elohim willing, I upload every Friday. Don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. If you no longer see this channel on this platform, please look for the videos on my website, truthunedited.com. Thank you for watching. I'm thankful for all of you. Thank you especially to those Elohim has placed it on your hearts to give, and you have done so. Thank you for your assistance in carrying out this ministry every week. Thank you for your blessings and your prayers. They truly support this ministry. You have no idea. Thank you for your obedience to Yah's call on your heart. Okay, thanks again for watching everyone. Happy Passover. I love you all.